Welcome to my talk, uh, Scaling Agile in Your Organization with the Spotify Model. My name is Stephen Haunts. First, I'd just like to congratulate everyone for making it through to the last session of NDC. You must be absolutely knackered. I know I am. OK, so just a little bit about me. So I work actually for two companies. We used to be one company uh, at the end of the year, but we, it's a startup, and we split it into two companies just because we had different investment coming into both companies. So the reason why that's relevant is I'm going to use our company as, in, as an example of where we try to apply and adapt the Spotify model to our company. And I'm also an author for Pluralsight, so if, if anyone's Pluralsight subscribers, you can check out some of my courses on there. I've currently got nine on there. And I'm a regular speaker as well, so this is my second time back here in Oslo, which is fantastic. And I've done pretty much all of the other NDCs as well, including Sydney this year, which I'm really looking forward to. So rough agenda for today then, so we're going to talk about problems with growth. Uh, sort of growth in, the com in a company, trying to scale your teams up. Uh, then we're going to introduce the Spotify model and what they did in their organization. And then I'm going to talk a bit more about how we adapted it to our organization, because the, our type of business is different to Spotify's, so therefore the model doesn't fit precisely. And then we're going to finish off by talking a little bit about organizational architecture versus enterprise architecture. So first of all, let's just do a really quick overview of Agile, just so everyone's on the same page. So this is a screenshot from the Agile Manifesto. Has everyone read this website before or familiar with it? Yeah, a few of you. So Agile fundamentally comes down to four values, and that is individuals and interactions over process and tools. So you know how we interact and work with people is more important than what fancy Kanban board you're using. Working software over comprehensive documentation. So you know what we all strive to do is deliver working software. So under Agile, you want to deliver smaller pieces of working software as fast as you can so that you can get feedback. And that's more important than having comprehensive waterfall-style documentation. Next one is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So this is all about the importance of actually working with the people that you're building software for and how you collaborate with them. And the last one is being able to respond to change. So you know the best laid plans that are written down are always completely inaccurate as soon as you finish writing them, because things change. And that should be expected and embraced under the Agile Manifesto. There's also 12 um, principles which go along with those. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but if you go to the agilemanifesto.org website, you can read the rest of the principles that are there. But they basically just uh, reiterate the importance of working with people, interactions, and delivering working software quickly. Now, the most common um, Agile methodologies used these days, these are certainly not all of them, but the most common setups that you tend to see is a team will use Scrum as their project management framework. But they'll also probably adopt some of the engineering practices from extreme programming. So that's things like test-driven development, um, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and all that good stuff. But also what is quite common is Kanban, which is a kind of a different principle to um, Scrum. Scrum is more an iteration-based model where you deliver working software, say, every two or three weeks. Whereas Kanban is more about continuous flow. So you don't work in fixed iterations. You're continuously delivering software into production. But you can have a hybrid, so you can have something called Scrumban, which is very similar to Kanban, except you reset the board after every iteration and uh, fill it with your new backlog. So that's just a very sort of high-level introduction of some of the Agile things that we're hopefully all familiar with. So now what I want to talk about is problems with growth. And I want to talk a bit about how our company has evolved and some of the problems that we've faced, which is why we've looked at adopting other models. So... It's two companies, well, we split down into two companies. The first one is called Buying Butler, and that is a buying concierge service which helps people buy cars online. And the second one, which is one I'm going to focus on most, is called Right in Dem, which is an online insurance claims management platform. So I'm not trying to sell you anything. It's not a sales pitch. We, we sell our offerings into large enterprises, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. So as I said, Writing Dem is an insurance claims management platform. We're trying to fix the broken process of making a claim on your motor vehicle predominantly at the moment. So currently at the moment, you know, if you crash your car and it's going to be written off, in the UK certainly at least, it could take up to 20, 25 days to settle that claim and get the money into your bank account because it's a very painful manual process with insurance companies. So what we try to do is take the entire thing online. It's a multi-tenant system that rebrands with the insurance company. And it has the ability for the claim handler and the claimant to both log on to their own individual portals and interact with each other to settle the claim. And what we found is that by developing this software, we've taken average claim handling times down from 25 days to about two or three days. In some cases, for straightforward claims, it was three hours. So, so that's the, the product that we tried to build. 
So we started this about a year ago. So I started at the company last May, and there was five of us. And you know, we had a bunch of developers, real people that we knew effectively. So we had people that were specialists in web development, ASP.NET at the time. We had people that were more focused on the back end, like myself. And we had someone who was an expert on a database. So we worked for about two and a half months to build a minimum viable product to test our theories about trying to fix these insurance claims processes. So we focus on one small use case, which is total loss, which is where if you crash your car, it's beyond economic repair, it's going to be written off. So we focus on that one small area. And we rapidly built a prototype, a working prototype, which we piloted with two large insurance companies in the UK. And this was useful. I mean, it is, it's not the most attractive looking piece of software, but it worked. And it helped prove the, uh, the theory that we could actually bring those claim handling times down. So with this prototype, we had an average claim handling time of about a week. And we also learned lots of lessons from it. So after that, we started working on what we classed the real version one, where we effectively binned the code that we had, because it was a very rough, quickly put together prototype. And we started rebuilding the software using tools like React, Redux, ES6, Node.js, Web API, and a lot of the other things that we're all familiar with. Now, as we've been doing this, we've been taking more investment into the company to help us grow. So you know, VC and investment companies have been finding out about what we're doing. They're quite excited about it, and they've injected money into the company, which has given us the ability to grow and take on more staff. But what we found is that taking on more staff quickly can cause lots of growing pains. So what we want to try and avoid is complete project chaos. So at the time, the, the, the challenges we were facing, so the scrum team was getting quite large. So we had, at one point, we had about 19 people on one scrum team because we were just working on the first total loss module. We still had a divide between front-end and back-end developers, which made it difficult, made, made working out some dependencies difficult sometimes. Our design team, who was working on the UX, was very much a separate function. They were run as a completely separate team because they were put together very quickly. And also the seating plan in the office was very split by function. So we had to move from a smaller office into a larger office. We wanted the developers and everyone to get productive as quickly as possible, so we just let them sat, sit where they want. You know, we, tried, we tried to move the entire company in in under a day. But because of this, parallel development was proving difficult. So we want to build, we've got about six product modules we want to build into the platform. But doing this in parallel was starting to look tricky. So our current structure doesn't support hyper growth. So we was five developers in May last year. We're 42 developers at the minute with some current hires that I've just made. And we're projected to be about 80 by the end of the year. With, and if we get the Series B round, which we're looking for, we'll probably double that next year. So we're going to be growing quite quickly. So we needed a, a solution that would allow us to grow, because the way we're currently working wasn't sustainable and wasn't scalable. So we started looking around and doing a bit of research. And you know, we had things like the Scrum Nexus framework, which we could look at. And I don't know if anyone saw Martin's talk on that earlier this morning. It was a very good talk. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of like the next evolution of Scrum, or it's an extension of Scrum. So it's quite a prescriptive framework in how it works. Then you've got more big corporate things like the Scaled Agile framework, which is very complex and very complicated, and we wasn't really that keen on it. Or is there another method? Is there another way in which we could try and do this? So whilst we were doing our research, we came across some videos and articles that have been published by some people at Spotify. So is anyone familiar with who Spotify is? Yeah. Does anyone work for Spotify? Good. <laughs> that could be awkward. So Spotify is a music streaming company, and a very good one at that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a customer, have been for years. Um, so you pay your monthly subscription, and you can essentially stream or download to your device any music you want to listen to. So it's a really, 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 really good product. And they've had a similar problem to us, but a lot, um, a lot further back in time, where they had to scale their company very, very quickly. So they put out um, a couple of videos, which are quite interesting. So if you're going to take photos of any slides, this one's a good one to take a photo of, because I urge you to watch the videos. And it's where they talk about their engineering culture at the company. And this is kind of what gave us the inspiration for how we wanted to structure our company. So I'm going to go over what, what's in these videos at a high level for the first bit. But if you want more detail, I strongly urge you to go watch these. So they found, um, like us, that agile practices were starting to get in the way. So Spotify decided to make them optional within their teams. So therefore, they valued the, or they 
preferred the values of the Agile manifesto, which we looked at earlier, over any particular framework like Scrum. And in terms of their management and the people that run the teams, they wanted people to be more like servant leaders as opposed to masters. So a servant leader is someone who's there to facilitate the team, remove any blockers, and make sure the team has everything they need to do their job, as opposed to being, as opposed to being someone who just stands there giving them orders and telling them what to do. So the way the Spotify model works is they break their teams down into a series of abstractions. And these abstractions are tribes, chapters, and guilds. And then they abstract further a tribe into what are called autonomous squads. And I'll show you some diagrams of this in a moment. But each of these individual squads or teams are free to pick their own processes and technologies at Spotify. So if one team wants to do Scrum, that's fine, they can do Scrum. If another one wants to do extreme programming, that's fine, they can do it. If another one wants to do Kanban, that's fine. Or they can make up something else completely, as long as it adheres to the general principles and values in the Agile Manifesto. So tribes are effectively product groupings in their world. So you might have uh, product groupings like Search, the Recommendations Engine, the Playback Engine, the Streaming Engine, and the Social Media Integration. And then each of these tribes, you have a series of squads. So they're individual teams. And a squad could be made up of anywhere from five to eight people. So it gives you kind of a good template of what you need to hire when you need to set up a new team. So the idea of a squad is that they are completely autonomous in how they work from each other. So they're kind of like mini startups on their own. And because of this, autonomy is actually quite motivating for the teams because it means it's very easy for them to make decisions. They haven't got you know, the rest of the enterprise to contend with when they make decisions. Which means decisions happen quickly. But each squad has to make sure their vision of what they're doing aligns to the larger company vision. So that's how they sort of keep themselves going in the right direction. So squads are self-organizing. So you know, once they're in their teams, they can organize themselves how they want. You know, people can potentially move between squads as well if they want to, if it makes sense. And this gives the teams a good sense of empowerment because they haven't got the, you know, the normal rigid controls of a, of a company around them. So when they're deciding what to build, you know, say, say the management says, you know, we need to build feature X into the system. A large part of the management's job is to explain why. You know, always start with why. Why are we building this? Is it going to bring us more revenue? Is it going to make things more efficient for the customer? Is, does it make things more efficient for us as an organization? And then what they'll do is they will work with the teams to decide what it is they're going to build, but then it's up to the team to decide how they're going to build it. So they have that level of control and autonomy in how they build things. So each squad has kind of like their own effective mission and vision statements, which is you know, the vision that they're trying to work towards, and that should align with the overall product vision of the company. But at any point, the, the overarching company uh, values and missions can always override what the, uh, the mission is of the uh, squad. So if they need to be sort of reset because they're going the wrong way slightly, it's the company vision that overrides that. So these squads have complete end-to-end -end responsibility for what they build. So they don't just build a piece of software, you know, chuck it over the wall to the infrastructure team and let them deploy it. They have full end-to-end -end control. So they design the software, they build it, they deploy it, they support it. So it's kind of like a DevOps mentality within their team. So they look after the entire product that's within their, their bounds. So squads all sit together. So there's a photo from them there. So they're all sitting together on, on the right over there. But each squad also has a breakout area. They must have absolutely huge offices. But they've all got a breakout area with some comfy seating area, lots of whiteboard space. They can have meetings and collaborate with each other. So although these squads are loosely coupled because they're you know, individual small teams, they are tightly aligned. So they're not in competition with each other as squads. They're there to be good citizens to each other. So they do have to talk to each other and collaborate. Because if you don't do that, then you just go back to having some chaos on your team or in your company. So to help do this, then, the squad will regularly have, each squad will regularly have meetings, kind of like a scrum of scrums, where you have a nominated individual from each team will meet up maybe you know, once a week, twice a week, or once a sprint. I'm not quite sure what their cadence is for doing that. And the idea for that is to help promote cross-pollination of ideas between teams. So if one team solves a particular problem, you know, then the other squad doesn't, you know, shouldn't have to go and reinvent that themselves. They should be able to share ideas. To make this work then, as we said before, the management needs to be more liberal than authoritative. So you need management that work as servant leaders who are there to 
remove any blockers and impediments to the team, make sure they have everything they need. If they need training and something, they should try and organise that for them. If there's any dependencies with other departments, they should try and remove those dependencies for them. And as you said, by cross collaboration with the squads, they, you know, they can share standards, patterns, tools and practices. So they're there to support each other. And they do this with effectively adopting an, op an internal open source model. So kind of like you know, an internal GitHub, I guess. So if any team designs a framework which could be useful to anyone else, it goes into their sort of shared repo so other teams can use it. So hiring into a company like Spotify, you're working in a team environment like this, cultural fit is really important. So when you're hiring people, you know, it's not just the skills, you know, their development skills that matter. I mean, of course, that's important, but it's not the only thing that's important. So you want to make sure you bring in people that haven't got egos, you know, have mutual respect for each other, are good at praising other developers, asking for help when stuck. You know, they shouldn't see being stuck in their work as taboo. Asking for help is fine and encouraged. And the ideal people you want are people that like to learn. You know, people like yourselves who come to conferences like this, you know, watch Pluralsight videos, read books, go to user groups, etc. So as I said, squads can define their own process. Um, that's actually a duplicate slide, that shouldn't be in there. So, um, but squads are free to choose whatever methodology they want to use, be it Scrum or Kanban or anything else. So the other abstraction we talked about was chapters. So that's what these um, yellow lines are that are going across horizontally. And a good way of thinking of chapters is, is kind of like a people manager or a person manager who leads across the teams. And the reason they do this is if, uh, say, one person wants to move from squad A to squad B, if they do that, they maintain a consistent line manager throughout. Because you know, you're supposed to build up a good working relationship with your manager. They're there to help you progress your career. So by having your line management split into what they call chapters, it just means you can, see, you can keep that consistent relationship with your manager. And the other abstraction they have uh, within their teams is something called guilds. And what guilds are is they're cross-functional areas of interest. So the way that works is you could have a guild for, say, web development, web APIs and back-end development, machine learning, and people can subscribe to those guilds, whether it be a, a channel on Slack or a meetup in the organization, and it's just a way for people to come together and learn who have shared interests. Um, Spotify and I have got to a, a particularly big size. They run these things, I think it's every quarter, called the Unconference, where each guild get, has an ability to put on a small conference within their organization, which people that are interested can go along to. It's a really cool idea. Unfortunately, my company's a bit too small to run conferences, but we, 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 we do make good use of the concept of guilds. And by doing things like guilds, it helps to encourage innovation within the team. And by having a good uh, culture of innovation, it aids with product diversification, product differentiation, and it also helps you explore new business opportunities. Because you never know who on your team is going to have that next killer idea, which is going to become a really successful product or feature on your product. But it also increases your competitive advantage, because if you've got a healthy innovation culture and learning culture in your organization, and your largest competitor hasn't, then that can give you a competitive advantage over them, because you can innovate and move quicker. And also, it's motivating for staff. I mean, I personally like working in an environment where people enjoy learning, so we all, we all learn together. So another good way of encouraging innovation is doing things like hackathons. Uh, this is something that Spotify does a lot. It's something that we've started doing at, at my company. And hackathons, uh, we, when we do them, when they do them, are generally centered on the customer. So you're trying to solve a problem which is going to help your end customer. And this can be deeply cross-functional, so it's not just something that the developers do. It involves testers, it can involve product owners who want to try out, say, new ways of defining stories. Well, hackathon's a good way of doing that. And it's very much focused on the output. Um, so generally, when you do a hackathon, you don't you wouldn't necessarily do it on your existing code base. You start from fresh, so you know, file new, and then you, you, you build it from scratch. And then once you've done that, you uh, once you've done that, you, you look at what you've done in a kind of like a retrospective or a demo. And then any of the good ideas can be taken forward into the product if necessary. So something like Spotify is very based around communities. I mean, we look at the names that are being used. You know, we've got tribes, squads, guilds. They're all very sort of community-sounding names. You know, if you imagine an island in the middle of the ocean somewhere with, with a tribe on it and lots of squads in there, it's all based around community, which is why they pick those names. So it's very community over formal structures. So it's not about having large formal um, company hierarchies like what we might traditionally have in a larger enterprise. 
So to make all of this work, releasing your software should be easy. And the way that they do it at Spotify is they make use of release trains. Has anyone heard of the release train concept before? So they have regular scheduled releases that may go out into production, say, you know, once a week, every two weeks or whenever. And if your feature's ready, it, it gets deployed. So, but to do that, they make use of feature toggles and feature switches. Because if your product or feature isn't ready, you don't want it to go out into production being turned on. So I'm guessing they don't make much use of feature branches. It's all, all deployed off of their main trunk line. So to make this sort of thing work, then obviously an investment in test automation and continuous delivery is very important. You need to have a good build infrastructure and testing infrastructure in place. So that's things like you know, your more traditional unit tests and integration tests, but also external automation tests. So you know, things like Selenium tests, which test your product from the outside in. When you restructure a team like this, and we're going to cover this a bit more later in the talk, but you need to move away from having a big monolithic application. And when Spotify started doing this, the application was one big monolithic, huge desktop client application. So they actually had to spend quite a lot of time refactoring the application and breaking it down into more discrete modules. So the way they've done that is Spotify is now effectively a Chromium browser with lots of components running inside it. But it's important that you don't have a big monolithic application when you try and have multiple teams working on the same product in parallel, because they'll just start tripping up each other. So is, is the Spotify model a silver bullet? Is it the answer to everything? And the answer is no, not at all. So when they, when they did this, they didn't sit down and think, we're going to build this massive, you know, this really cool framework for structuring a team and then publish it and everyone will adopt it. That wasn't their intention. They were doing what they had to do for their company, but because they was pleased with it and happy with it, they decided to sort of let the world know what they were doing. So it's not a one-size-fits-all, and this is why I want to talk about how we're trying to apply it, because we're a different type of business to what Spotify is, so we've had to make some changes. But to make this sort of thing work, um, you need very good support from the very top of your company, so from the CEO, CIO, CTO, everyone downwards, they have to fully buy into doing something like this, because if they don't, then you're just not going to get anywhere with it and it will fail. But the key thing we want to remember then is, with the Spotify model, we're adopting the spirit of the model, but not necessarily the whole model. So we're trying to replicate the idea, but not necessarily replicate it exactly. So this is where I want to talk about sort of different types of companies. So Spotify is a business-to-consumer company, so they sell to people like me and you, you know, consum average consumers, which means they've got much more control over how they build and release their product. So they're in charge of the product pipeline, they can release things when they want. Whereas a company like mine, right in Dem, is a business-to-business -business company. So our customers are large corporate insurance companies. So the entire dynamic of how you build and release your products is completely different. So we can't just go releasing stuff when we like, because we have, we have these large insurance companies to deal with, which I'm sure is a common problem. Has anyone else ever had that situation? Anyone sell or work in large enterprises? Yeah, so it's, it's a completely different dynamic. So our goal then was to be able to scale the company safely as we take on more investment without taking chaos. So we know we're going to grow very quickly, and we know that that's hard. It's probably one of the hardest problems you have to face, is growing quickly. So when we started doing this then, so we thought, you know, the Spotify model looks good. There's, there's some good ideas there that we want to adopt. So we start, first of all started off by looking at um, how happy and engaged our employees are. And I came across this um, diagram, and I use this all the time. So again, this is a really good one to take a photo of, because I, mean, I literally have printouts of this in the office. Uh, the diagram is taken from an article on the Harvard Business Review website. But it just, it's, it's such a useful tool. So it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So starting down the bottom, we have, you know, what, what do you have to have to have a satisfied employee? So we've got things like you know, having a safe work environment. You, know, you want to go to work in a safe environment where you can just get on with your job and be productive. So to be satisfied, you also need to have the tools and training that you need. You know, we all need the tools to do the job. You know, if, for example, you know, if ReSharp is going to make you more productive, but the company's not willing to pay for it, are, are you going to be particularly satisfied? Because your life's going to be harder. So can you get your job done without excess bureaucracy? So that's another thing which leads to employee satisfaction. So if you've got lots of internal politics and bureaucracy at your company, you generally tend not to be that satisfied. Well, I certainly don't. And also, to make employees satisfied, are they being paid and rewarded fairly? So, and it's quite an obvious one, but you know, as a company, you need to pay at least market rate or better so that people 
won't feel they're being devalued and want to move on. So next level up then is how to make employees engaged. So the first part then is are they part of an extraordinary team? So this sort of comes down to your hiring practices, the people you bring into the company. Are you bringing in people that are absolutely awesome and are going to fit into the team well? So it's not just um, skills. It's, it's more like the cultural sort of human side of it as well. You know, do they carry any egos? And I've got a perfect example. I was interviewing one guy. Obviously, I won't say his name. Um, but we was interviewing him, and his technical skills were absolutely amazing. He, you know, he completely aced the interview in terms of his technical skills. He was very, very talented. But throughout the interview, he was you know, continually having a go at his previous company. And when, when we was um, probing him on particular scenarios which might not have gone so well, he was very quick to blame other people and not himself. So because of that, we thought, well, he's probably not going to fit into the company that well just because of this attitude that he's portrayed in the interview. So even though his skills are absolutely top-notch, we turned him down. And those are the kind of sort of difficult decisions you need to make when you hire to build a good culture. So another thing to make employees engage is, is it an environment where they can learn and grow every day? So are you doing new, exciting, interesting things, or are you just doing typical old-school CRUD applications with a load of text box on the screen? Now, and as an organisation, do you offer sort of the, the tools they need to learn? So things like Pluralsight, Linda, Safari Books. I always say Pluralsight first because I'm supposed to, but you know, anything like that. And also for them to be engaged, you know, do they feel like they're making an impact? You know, is there, have they got meaning in the work that they're doing? So if you're working on something that you know is just going to be binned or it's not going to be used very much, I mean, that's not going to make you very engaged, is it? Because you know that there's no real value to the work you're doing. So for an employee to be engaged, they need to have a good sense of value in the work they're doing. Then the final one on top of that is, you know, so you've got satisfied employees, you've got engaged employees, but are they inspired? So inspired means, you know, are they getting inspiration from their company's mission? So this isn't just, you know, have they got meaning in the work they're doing? Do they fully buy in and believe what the company's trying to do? So we're writing down, we've tried to really um, be transparent with our staff and really, you know, get them engaged in the whole mission of what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to reduce claim handling time. We're trying to make people's lives better. You know, when you've crashed your car, it's very stressful. You know, if you've got children, you need a vehicle, don't you? So you need to get them to school and whatnot. So people are going to be very upset when they've crashed a car. So we're trying to make their lives better by making our insurance companies better. And that's what our staff buy into. They buy into the whole overall vision of what we're doing. And also, is, um, are they inspired by the leaders in their company? I'd like to say mine say yes, but I can't speak for them, but I'm hoping they will be. OK, so if we go on to the actual Spotify model itself and kind of how we've adapted it. So we, we brought in another concept called Islands, because, you know, Islands, Tribes, Squads, why not? So, because we, we, we split the company into two because of um, different investment pipelines coming into the company. So, we, we effectively called the company's islands. So, we've got Buying Butler and we've got Writing Dem. Now, all of our teams work across, um, in each company, work across a, a mission statement, a set of principles, and a set of values. So, setting these uh, values and principles up front is very important for the team. So, for Buying Butler, our mission was you know, to enable everyone to buy with the confidence of an expert. And for writing them, it's simply customer managed claims. And following that, we set a series of principles. These are the guiding principles of the company. So we've got things like deliver for our customer's customer. So that means you know, we're trying to make the claimant's life better, even though our actual customer is the insurance company. Open communication and transparency. So we're very open in, with our um, development teams. You know, we let them know what's going on with investment. We let them know about customers that we're talking to. So we, they, they have a good sense of what's coming up in the future with the company. So we don't try and keep anything from them. Uh, so the next one is they should be empowered, but with accountability. So we want them to be empowered to make decisions, but obviously we have to deliver working software. So there has to be a level of accountability that goes along with that. Uh, fail fast, learn fast, and iterate. So when we try out new ideas, we want to know if they're going to work as quickly as possible. If an idea isn't a great idea, that's fine, but we'd rather get to that decision sooner rather than later so we can learn from it. Listen first, then act. So this is all around sort of delivering feedback to people. So I've worked in many organisations where people can be quite blunt and give feedback, which you know, can hurt other people's feelings. So we try and have a culture of, you know, if you're giving feedback or listening to someone else's view, just make sure you listen first. You know, very good listening skills. And the last one is celebrate small wins. So you know, if we deliver a module or we 
fix some major bugs. We like to celebrate that. We, we go out for team lunches, we go out for drinks. It's, it's little small things, but it, it makes a big difference to a company culture. So off the back of that then, we have the individual values which we look for in the people that we hire. So these are things like people that are selfless, you know, they're happy to admit when they've made a mistake and learn from it. People that have empathy and are empathetic. People that have courage to make bold decisions in the choices that they make. People that are curious, you know, curious about technology. They want to be, you know, we want to push boundaries in what we're doing. We're currently doing a load of work around machine learning, so we want people to be curious about that and want to learn. Trust, so we have lots of two-way trust between the development teams and the rest of the company. We trust them to get the job done. And they trust us to be completely open and transparent with them so they know exactly where the company's going. And then we have passion. Um, you know, we want people to be passionate and enjoy what they do. Honesty, um, being constructive, giving good constructive feedback, and having good judgment in everything they do. So that's kind of where we started before we started splitting the teams off. Before define the mission, the principles and values, make them public within the company so everyone knows exactly what it is we as a company expect and want from our people. So then we started splitting down to the next level of abstraction. So we, we're trying to work out the best way of doing it. And what we settled on is we work in different insurance verticals, so that's how we split our tribes out. So we have a tribe which is motor insurance, one which is marine insurance, because we've done some work like insuring cargo containers. Uh, house insurance and health insurance. So they're the main tribes that we have set up in the company. And then each tribe can have a series of squads in there. So as we said before then, so the project management teams and the management define why we're building something, why this is important, you know, you know explain about the business ideas behind it. And then we work with the teams to work out what we're going to build and then the teams are empowered to decide how they're going to build it. So like with Spotify, our teams are completely autonomous in how they manage their work. We treat each one as kind of a separate little startup. But for consistency, we made a decision that was different to Spotify. So we, along with collaboration with the rest of the teams, decided to consistently use Scrum across each team. And the reason for this is, um, A, the teams like using Scrum, and B, because we have to do a lot of compliance reports with insurance companies. And one of the things they audit us on is our software development methodologies and how we run internally. So it's actually much easier to have Scrum rolled out consistently in the company. That's not necessarily valid for any other company or every other company, but for us, it made sense. So just like normal Scrum, each team has sta daily stand-ups. Uh, or squad rather has daily stand-ups. A squad has a product owner and a scrum master who works in the team. So this, you know, we're down, now down into a traditional scrum. But every other day we have nominated members from each squad who will meet up and have like a scrum of scrums meeting, just so they can communicate what each team is working on at any one time. And this is really good for trying to solve cross-team dependencies as well. Yeah, so it aids the alignments between the teams. So the next thing we added uh, again, in the whole tribes and villages. Sorry, is a question? Yeah, I have a question on the previous slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you say you have scrum of scrums every other day? Yeah, we do them every other day. Okay. Do you find it that useful information that often? Yeah, well, initially we did it every day and it, was, it didn't really work. So we've moved to every other day. If it becomes that it's too much information, again, we might move it to once a week. So at the moment we're on every other day. But if needs be, we'll change it. So this is one of the main changes we made. So we've got this thing running across the top called lookouts. You know, every island has a tribe with squads in it, and they have lookouts to protect them. So really what our lookouts are doing is protecting the teams from our insurance company customers. And, and the reason for that is, is, so under the Agile Manifesto, it talks a lot about customer collaboration. You know, so ideally, if you're working in an organization, the people you're building the software for are maybe in the same company. So it's very easy to work with them. But the insurance companies we work with are all over the globe. So what our lookouts line is, is effectively um, a series of outward-facing project managers and um, customer relationship managers. And their responsibility is to go out, visit these companies, gather any requirements that they have. I mean, because al although it is our own product, each company and tenant that we work with has their own sort of requirements that they need build building into the system. So there's lots of custom configuration that we have to do. So what the lookout's responsibility for is making sense of what the insurance companies want to do and then working with the internal um, product manager to make sure everything's prioritised and then it eventually ends up in the correct backlogs for the appropriate team. 
But we felt it important to have that level of um, protection, I guess, between the internal teams and the insurance companies. Because these companies, they're huge enterprises, you know, 50, 100,000 employees. Any development they do in-house is probably waterfall. They're very slow in how they work. So we wanted to protect the teams from that sort of level of bureaucracy by just having this extra layer in the middle. Yeah, so traditionally, the, uh, these companies use waterfall internally. So one thing that has been quite challenging for us is, you know, we're building our own products. You know, we, we, we plan things into the backlog uh, that go through a uh, planning process. So we try and release things, you know, when they're ready. But that's not always easy to do. So sometimes we do have to commit to dates, which I know a lot of Agile teams absolutely hate having deadlines imposed on them, but sometimes we have no choice. So generally, when we try and do planning, we try and do left-to-right planning. So we go, we go through the, um, like the, the scrum planning sessions of our teams. We work out you know, what's going to be in each sprint, and then you can do a rough estimation of when you think something's going to be finished based on the team's velocity. But sometimes, if we're working with an insurance company and they need a particular set of uh, features delivered by a certain time, we then have to do right-to-left planning. So we have this date fixed. We then have to work backwards and work out how we're going to deliver it. And the reason that happens, and it's not ideal, but the reason it happens is because there's normally complex legal contract negotiations that happen with these insurance companies. So to get these features out into production and get them using them, it might have a three-month lead-up time of sort of legal bureaucracy and red tape that has to happen. So sometimes, in some situations, we do have to plan it the other way around. So, so it's not always a right-to-left approach, though. Um, we only do that under specific customer demands. But it is something that has sort of bitterness and causes quite a few problems previously. But we try to keep the teams as agile as we can where possible. Another concept which we um, have started rolling out is um, we've got the squad up there called the Cross-Cutting Concerns Team. And this has been really valuable to us. So there's, on each project, or every project that you work on, there's always sets of functionality which spans lots of teams and product modules. So we've set up a separate small squad just to look after these sorts of affairs. So for example, we've recently started building servers for doing identity server, so we can have consistent identity across all our product modules. Because it spans a concern across all the teams, we've set up a new team which focuses just on, on those cross-cutting concerns. Another example of what they're working on is content, um, content delivery. So we need to deliver all of our content in multiple different languages. So we're working with some third-party content management systems and our own internal APIs so that if we say, you know, for this particular tenant, it needs to be in German, all the content comes back in the correct language. And again, that's a cross-cutting concern, a piece of functionality that all the teams will need to use. The other thing that's really useful in having a team like that is um, they're very good at doing proof of concepts. So, for example, we've got a product which we're going to be building soon, which is a payments module. So in the UK, certainly, when an insurance company pays out, they still send you a physical check to cash it to your bank, which is very slow. So what we want to do is when you reach a settlement on your claim, we want to transfer the money straight into your bank account. So it's very, very quick. There's probably about five or six different vendors we can use for that. So what the cross-cutting concerns team will do is they'll evaluate each of the vendors and do small proof of concepts. So when we actually form the payments squad team, a lot of these decisions have already been made, so they can just get on with the job of building the product. So as we mentioned before, so teams are, need to be autonomous, but you also need to have a level of accountability in there as well. So the teams, you know, whilst they have a lot of freedom in how they work and how they do their planning and how they organise themselves, we do have to get stuff delivered as quickly as we can. You know, we're a startup, we're running on investment, we need to get stuff built quickly. So that, that does mean you need to have a level of, ac of accountability in the team as well. So you know, there has to be some kind of repercussion if something doesn't get done on time. Although generally my teams are pretty good and they're very good at delivery. So one thing I want to touch on then is um, organizational architectures versus enterprise architectures. So everything we've talked about so far in sort of taking a team and basically splitting it into a different set of abstractions, that is called an organizational architecture. And really, it's no different to an enterprise architecture. You know, you have an idea for a product and you split it down into different abstractions and modules. You know, you have this bit talking to this bit with a queue. It's kind of the same principle. It's an architecture. Now, in 1967, there's a guy called Melvin Conway um, who, um, who said that an, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. 
And then Fred Brooks, in his uh, Mythical Man Month book, sort of quoted this, and he called it Conway's Law. So as an example, if you had a room with four programmers in there, and you asked those programmers to write a compiler, they're probably going to write a four-stage compiler, because it's a function of the way their team is structured. So when we look back at how uh, writing demo was initially structured, you know, we had the leadership team, we had uh, you know, product owners and product managers, we had front-end developers, back-end developers, a SQL guy, and testers. So what we ended up with was a very typical end-tiered architecture, which, which was quite a you know, big monolith. But then we changed the organizational architecture to be based around um, tribes and squads, which meant that the existing architecture we built wouldn't work for us, because if you have multiple teams trying to work on this system all at once, they're just going to trip each other up, and it's going to be chaos. So what we've done is we've moved over to a more modular-based architecture, where each product module is its own separate set of pages, it's got its own APIs, its own document stores, and everything communicates using event sourcing, sort of CQRS and event streaming across a message bus. So the key message there is that by refactoring the company, We've had to refactor and change how we build the software as well. If you do one without the other, then you're going to run into serious problems. Yeah, I just said that bit. Yeah, so if you do one, you have to do the other. Okay, so if we summarize some of the sort of key findings, and I've got some sort of key takeaways from this. So. The model was popularized by Spotify, but they never intended it to be a universal framework that's adopted by everyone. So things like Scrum and Scrum Nexus, you know, they're very prescriptive frameworks. They have user manuals that you can download, and it's very you know, prescribed how you build it or how you implement it. That's not what Spotify intended. They did what was right for them. They were proud of it, so they published some videos and the blog posts about it, and it's got quite popular and caught on. But the, you know, so the key summary then is you know, we have tribes. In the tribes you have small squads, which could be five to eight man teams. Chapters are kind of cross-functional or cross-team leadership essentially, so that if you do move from one team to another, you can con you keep your consistent line manager. And then we've got the guilds, which are uh, cross-functional areas of interest and learning. But as you said, if you try and move over to anything like this, then the culture that you put in place is essential and very important. So this is something that we use quite a lot at our company to try and assess how we think we're doing with the staff. So we, we, we poll the staff every now and again to try and give us honest feedback on where they think they fit, and then we try and map it into where the organization is on this chart. So some key takeaways, just to bring the whole course down to a series of simple bullet points. So this model is really good when you want to rapidly increase your team. So we're currently running seven squads at the moment. Um, some are smaller than the others, but we've got seven discrete squads. So if you, if you need to scale the team, it's very, it's very good. When I need to bring on, say, the payments team, for example, I know, you know roughly how many people I need to, to hire. I know roughly what sorts of developers and uh, staff that I need and what kind of skills they need. So I can bring these teams on very, very quickly. But the Spotify model is not one size fits all. You need to adapt it to your work environment. That's why I wanted to show you how my company's applied it compared to how Spotify has done it, because we work in completely different industries. One's business to business, one's business to consumer. So things have to be different. It's not as prescriptive as Scrum Nexus or Scaled Agile Framework, although if you look closely at what we've done, because each of our teams is running Scrum, we do actually have a lot of similarities with the Scrum Nexus Framework. To do something like this, it requires adoption from the top of the organization. So if you haven't got full support from the leadership of your company when you want to try and do something like this, then you're going to run into massive problems. It has to be universally agreed from the top of the company that it's a good idea to do. Cultural fit is as important, if not more important, than skills when you're hiring. So obviously skills are very important. People need to be able to do the job. But how they're going to fit and work with the team is very important as well. So small focus squads create autonomy with a greater sense of ownership. So one thing that my teams have all said is that now they're working in much smaller teams. There's much less information for them to process, which gives them a greater sense of freedom, and it gives them a good sense of ownership. So we use Microsoft Visual Studio Team Services to manage all of our work. Each team has a completely separate backlog, which they manage themselves when they go through sprint planning. Now, we can look at the entire, all of the backlogs together holistically if we want to, but 
for the teams, breaking all that information down into smaller pieces of work is actually a lot easier for them to work in. A model like this encourages a learning culture. So the whole idea behind the guilds is that you're encouraging your teams to learn and sort of grow as a team. And also, if you change your organizational architecture, you must also address your system architecture. So you can't do one without the other, because you'll run into problems. So that's effectively what I wanted to talk about today. So thank you for coming along. Um, I have a blog, stephenhaunts.com. Um, I've got a contact button up there if anyone wants to get in touch. But I'm also on Twitter. So it'd be, be good to engage with people on Twitter. Um, I also run a, or co-run a user group. I'm from Derby in the centre of uh, the UK. Uh, so we run a Derby, Derbyshire.net user group. So if anyone happens to be in Derby on the last Thursday of the month, you're welcome to pop along. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> if you've now reached the end of the conference, you can all go home and sleep. <laughs> thank you.